Okay, so close reading. I wanted to create this separate video series in order to discuss something we have been referencing and hopefully, hopefully learning in this course by reading and discussing works of literary criticism, namely close reading. Okay. I want to discuss it with you primarily because of the first, because, um, because many of the first papers, for one reason or another, did not really produce close readings. Um, even though new criticism or deconstruction were across the board, the two methods selected by everyone in the class. So if I did not see close readings in these papers, what did I see? I saw a very impressive ability to isolate key passages from Mrs. Dalloway and situate them within a three-page argument. I saw an even more impressive ability to stitch together within a single paragraph several shorter passages drawn from a wide array of pages uh, uh, <clears throat> meant to establish and illustrate some sort of pattern or problem which recurs throughout the novel. But while these two important rhetorical skills demonstrate some, some sort of prior attentiveness to the novel in the pre-writing stages, they do not necessarily perform attentiveness within the paper itself. They do not necessarily perform the closeness to which the term close reading refers. Many papers included long and rich passages from Mrs. Dalloway only to end the paragraph one sentence later. Many included long passages only to go on to speak generally about the character or theme that the passage exemplifies, rather than the passage itself. Mrs. Dalloway is such a rich, dense, and complex work of literature that you cannot take it for granted that I will immediately see what you want me to see in the passage you quote. That I, you cannot take it for granted, let me read it again, that I will, you cannot take it for granted that I will immediately see what you want me to see in the passage you quote. Though you need not slowly linger with every single passage you extract from the text, especially shorter ones, that you weave into your own syntax, the truly key pieces of textual evidence require explication, which is to say, unfolding, unpacking, explanation. But what does one unpack and how? It occurs to me that Parker does not really address these questions in our textbook and that they might best be addressed by looking at works of literary criticism we have read and discussed together in class. First, it might be useful to look at James Naramore's book chapter on Mrs. Dalloway. This is found on Sakai. You rec recall that he quotes several long passages from the novel. But did you notice how he begins the sentences that immediately follow each of these passages? Page 79, quote, Here, all of these quotes fall are from the sentence that fo immediately follow a long quotation. Page 79, here the language conveys a special sort of mood, dot, dot, dot. Page 81, this vision, this vision of London is wholly in Clarissa Dalloway's fancy, dot, dot, dot. Page 83, what is important here, dot, dot, dot. Page 89, here Virginia Woolf begins by mimicking Lady Bruton's conversation. Page 91, the short sentences here serve not so much to characterize Septimus, dot, dot, dot. Page 94, the first two excerpts above reveal, dot, 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 page 97. We can use stream of consciousness to describe both of these passages, but it still seems to me, dot, 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 page 103. Indirect as this statement is, dot, dot, dot. Do you see the pattern? The very first sentence following the long quote immediately returns us as Naramore's readers and as Wolf's readers to the quote and more than that, to the detail of the literary text in the quote that matters to Naramore. He explicitly indicates what we should take from it and why it is important to his concerns and his ongoing argument. Even moments where Naramore does not use words like here or this or these right away, nevertheless, nevertheless <clears throat> return us all the same to the quote or situate the quote before moving on with a close reading of what is interesting or important about the passage itself. 
In short, Naramore does not let the passages speak for themselves. They are his textual evidence, no doubt. But just like a lawyer in a courtroom or a scientist communicating the results of his, ex of his experiments, we as literary critics need to explain our evidence to our readers, even if we presume they are familiar with Wolfe's novel. In fact, even for me, someone who's very familiar with Wolfe's novel, to quote a long passage and then say nothing about it is even worse, because I see so much more than many of you might be seeing in that passage, because I'm so much more familiar with it. Okay, but even if you know that you should return to your reader to the key passages in order to support your thesis and argument more effectively, what does one point out, right? What do you point out in the passage? And how much detail do you go into? Again, that's really up to your argument and to the, the moment in the paper in which you quote that passage. To help illustrate this point, I think it can be really instructive to look at how different literary critics deal with the same passage from Mrs. Dalloway. Consider the treatments of Peter Walsh's dream of the solitary traveler in Regent's Park. This is when he sort of, after, after being a creep and stalking a woman through London, finds his way to the park where um, I'm doing this because it's on the map in the front of the book. It's, it's a northern part of the map where he is in the same park as uh, Rhesia and Septimus, um, and where he falls asleep on a bench next to a nurse who's knitting. Okay. Um, in the next video, <clears throat> so this one's short, in the next video, I'll read this scene from the novel before moving on to our critics in videos three and four. Okay, So I'll be back with the passage from the novel.